Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Saw X, or Saw 10, released in 2023. Saw X sees the return of John Kramer, aka Jigsaw, even though he died 17 years ago, or seven movies ago in franchise terms. He appeared in Saw's 4 through 8 via flashbacks and cassette tapes he conveniently recorded before his death, but he sat out the Chris Rock-led Spiral, only having a cameo in picture form. Spiral was the first Saw film with a story completely divorced from John Kramer. The first seven Seven Saws were released literally once a year from 2004 to 2010. They form a beautiful, messy soap opera, with every installment adding to the interwoven web of characters. The eighth film, Jigsaw, released later in 2017, kinda sidestepped the continuity, technically taking place before all the other films, and it introduced a lame-ass, needless character. Will we ever see Logan again? I don't really care! But Saw X is back to basics, y'all, and takes place between Saws 1 and 2, back before John Kramer got his neck slit open with a saw. Though he's clearly older, if you do a side-by-side -side comparison, I will happily pretend he's the same age if it means we get Tobin Bell in a starring role. Bell is 80 now and gives an incredible return performance as John, humanizing him more in a single film than eight others managed to combine. In my Saw kill counts from five and a half years ago, yes, time is scary, I often made fun of John Kramer's self-righteousness. Killing is distasteful! Murderers say what? But Saw X gives you the most jiggy perspective yet, with Bell exploring the character's inner emotions. My job is to bring humanity to John Kramer. Helps too that he's up against an absolutely evil monster. Makes it easier to root for him than when his victim, like, what was it, took antidepressants? <laughs> You're the type of person who swallows antidepressants to hide the pain. Yeah. Saw X was touted as a return to form for the series, and styles itself after the annual installments of the mid to late aughts. One, two, three, and six are the ones that are kind of relevant to this story. They got the perfect guy for the job, too. It's directed by Kevin Groydert, who edited the first five films and Jigsaw, and directed parts six and seven. If anyone knows the series, it's the person who edited it. And Groydert makes sure Saw X is rewarding, with plenty of nods to series lore. Groydert was joined by other veterans of the franchise, like composer Charlie Klauser and producers Oren Coles and Mark Berg, who have headed the series from the very beginning. And writers Peter Goldfinger and Josh Stolberg wrote Jigsaw and Spiral, which aren't my favorites, but they do a great job this this time through. On screen, we get a return of Shawnee Smith as Amanda Young, John Kramer's protege. Amanda was a powerful presence in the OG trilogy, and her relationship with Kramer gives this film a beating heart. Smith and Bell have 20 years of chemistry between them, and Saw X wisely highlights it. I just wanted to see them on screen together doing their thing and showing their love for each other. Even though it's a throwback, Saw X is also refreshing in many ways. It's quieter and more contemplative, especially early on, so much so that it might come off as slow-paced to some. I think it's beautiful, and makes for an excellent setup to the later carnage. It also takes place in Mexico, the first time a Saw film has ever specified its setting. I always joke that the series takes place in Cityton, capital city of state. The change in setting is a breath of fresh air, and gives us a nice taste of culture that helps it stand out as its own installment. I love the Saw series, and I love Saw X, way more than the three installments that came before it. It's got everything you could want from a Saw film, including, yes, plenty of traps and kills. So how's about we finally... Sorry. Ha- Oh. God. <laughs> James A. Janice, you spend your life surrounded by horror. But now, you must experience true horror if you wish to be free. And by your own tools. <laughs> Zorn, what the hell are you- Wait, you think you could torture me with today's sponsor, Manscaped? Yeah. Ha! Please! What you've got there is the Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. It takes your grooming game to the next level, and I know everything that's inside. Like the Weed Whacker 2.0 for taming unruly nose hairs, but with skin-safe technology to reduce nicks and cuts, it won't be doing you much good. Then there's the Crop Soother Aftershave, made to soothe razor burn and itchiness as hair regrows. Can't say I'm too afraid of that. Or are you thinking the Crop Preserver's clear, dry, and quick absorbing lotion with soothing aloe vera will really break me down? No, don't be ridiculous. I'm going to make oh, sure- Oh, oh, you're gonna go for the big guns, huh? The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra? Yes, exactly. And that is where I'm going- What? To 
Upgrade your grooming routine with its two interchangeable skin safe blades, waterproof design, and LED spotlight for illuminating those hard to see areas? Yeah, yeah, I bet you could use that. <laughs> no, I am going to use this to shave your head. That's right, gonna cut off your pretty boy locks if you don't reschedule They Talk Season 2. What do you say to that, James? Okay, man, there was a strike. Calm down. How about February? Cool. It works for me. <laughs> Ooh, I better get shaven. Ooh, my spiral. You don't need to torture yourself for great savings this holiday season. Head over to manscaped.com and get yourself or a loved one the ultimate grooming experience for 20% off plus free shipping with promo code KILLCOUNT20. Alright, now that that's taken care of, let's get to the kills. The movie begins with an old friend. Yep, that's me, John Kramer. Bet you're wondering how I got here. It's because of the cancer. As John waits for his latest MRI results, we get a title card that doubles as an assessment of his prognosis. Months. At best. Yep, that sucks. John does the things the dying are supposed to, like attend group sessions, but it doesn't leave him too impressed. So your advice to me is to die easy. He'd rather get jiggy with it and teach this hospital custodian a lesson when he sees him robbing a patient. That's a good way to get yourself trapped. I've had my eyes on you, and I do not like what I see. I'd like to play a game. Just like that, we're back in Trap Town. For the crime of having sticky fingers, this guy's gotta break all five of his in under a minute. If he fails, his eyeballs will get sucked straight out of his skull. And pro tip, you don't want that. Instead of doing them all at once, this guy breaks each finger individually. When he fails, the trap follows his lead, sucking out his eyeballs one by one through them tubes. <laughs> Looking like little ocular gerbil guys. It's all great fun, of course. But alas, turning this dude's head into a bowling ball is but a daydream. He escapes John's fantasies by second guessing his near dwelling. Good choice. John visits his nearest Panera Bread to write his last will and testament. There, he runs into Henry Kessler, a guy he knows from his support group. Henry had stage 4 pancreatic cancer, but now it's completely gone thanks to an experimental treatment. He's all good now, and all it cost him was a tummy scar. Henry gives John the name of his miracle doctor and sends him on his merry way. At home, John researches Dr. Finn Peterson using his favorite search engine. Web search! Well renowned for its easy to remember URL. Through trusted sources like Article 3 and mm, Article, he learns that Dr. Peterson Peterson's techniques are a bit controversial, just like Henry warned him. Hell, it, it isn't approved by anybody. Dr. Peterson practices out of Norway, which is where Henry said he went to get healed. Lovers of Saw soap opera elements, like myself, were thrilled to hear this since it directly ties into Saw 6, the healthcare one, which was also directed by Kevin Groydert. It's one of the best Saws, and in it, John tried to get his insurance to cover this very treatment. I found a treatment for my cancer that I think holds a lot of promise. This is a doctor in Norway. I know the technique he describes is slightly different, but I'll chalk that up to a minor continuity error. The filmmakers intended for this connection to exist, and a deleted scene shows John emailing William Easton. In fact, I think they were going to include the scene from Saw 6 here before ultimately deciding to leave it implied. Of course, Saw X doesn't take place in Norway, since Finney Peterson's been run underground. His work is being carried on in Mexico by his daughter, Dr. Cecilia Peterson. In a video, she says Big Pharma and Big Government are keeping her daddy down. But come to Mexico, Mexico and get a drug cocktail and just a wee bit of cranial surgery. You know, just a little knock knock knocking on the noggin. John has found a sliver of hope and clings to it as he sends Cecilia a desperate email. His apparent email address, kramerjohn994 at gmail.com, was set up in real life to respond in character with an out of country message and a phone number. Calling that number led to a pre-recorded message that asked you to play a game. Thank you for reaching out. A very brave thing to do. Cecilia gets back to John and says he can have a spot in their next vaguely legal testing session. He hops on the next plane to Mexico. You can tell because everything looks like Breaking Bad. He's picked up by a cabbie named Diego who gives him a scenic tour of the city. Production filmed on location in Mexico City and it really opens the movie up. I don't know if John's interested in a tour right now though. I think he's got other things on his mind, like the cancer. Literally. All of a sudden, the tour is cut short by armed jignappers who threaten John at gunpoint. After confirming his name, though, they reveal this is just a part of the onboarding process. A super secret security step slash epic prank bro. They take him to see Cecilia, and the doctor is in a giant mansion. And also a disused chemical plant. There, she hides from big pharma assassins with her staff. There's Gabriella, a housekeeper and former patient, Valentina, a nurse, Mateo, a surgeon, and Carlos, a kid who kicks soccer balls against a wall. Crucial part of the operation. In an operating room designed by Joe Goldberg, John meets Parker Sears, Dr. Peterson's latest success story. They play rock, paper, cancer. Sorry, cancer. I bounced. Uh, brain. 
you win. Ah, yep, brain always beats thyroid. Later that night, Cecilia makes small talk with John, who says he's a retired civil engineer and architect. Lately, he's taken up hobbies. I help people overcome inner obstacles. Inner obstacles like having depression. John can't sleep before the big day, so he wears himself out teaching ball bouncer Carlos how to fix his bike and get a girl's attention. Hala. Holla. Let me holla at ya. When it comes time to cut the cancer out, malignant style, Dr. Cortez won't let John sleep through the surgery. Instead, he has to be kept in a drug-induced fugue state as he watches them cut into what's either his brain or some blueberry cheesecake. Eventually, he conks out and wakes up to good news. He's as cured as bacon. Now, his whole life happens next. Tobin Bell is magnificent this entire film, but this scene really highlights his acting acumen. He returned for his ninth appearance as John Kramer because he liked Stolberg and Goldfinger's script. The script uh, for this particular film is very strong, uh, 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 perhaps one of the strongest Saw films. Still, Bell found himself rewriting some of John's dialogue on set. The writers were cool with it, thankful for Bell's 19 years of experience knowing what the character would and wouldn't say. John's instructed to take a daily drug cocktail and never under any circumstances take off that head bandage. But they didn't say anything about taking off all the rest. Looking good, Tobin, who is again 80 years old and still so agile. Now John's free to live and get back to making torture acts. But wait a minute, he's got a new lease on life. Maybe he shouldn't kidnap, torture, and murder people? You probably recognize that doodle as the rack trap used on Timothy Young in Saw 3. I wonder if John had to go dig through the trash later to get his plans for it back. John wants to get a gift for his saviors, and though they try to keep their location secret, they must have forgotten this motherfucker's an engineer. With some trigonometry, which you said you'd never use, John is able to track down Peterson's healthcare hacienda, but he finds it completely abandoned, except for flickery light and evidence of bamboozling. He discovers that the surgical footage he saw was from a DVD. This whole damn thing was a ruse, a cunning attempt to trick him. In a final moment of confirmation, John removes his wrappings and finds no surgical scars. I mean, they didn't even bother to shave him. It's taken 30 whole minutes to get to this moment, but I truly think the buildup is worth it. It lets us understand why, for the first time in the entire series, we see John Kramer in a panic. His new lease on life has been broken. All that's left is for him to play a game of revenge. John starts with Diego at one of his tour stops, the statue of the Mesoamerican god Tlaloc. He shows Diego he's been using Duolingo. ¿A dónde vamos? Al infierno. The cabbie wakes up to find that John's given him bomb implants in a trap that references one in the video game Saw 2 Flesh and Blood. John tells him he knows the truth. Diego not only drove John into the welcoming committee, he also played the part of Dr. Cortez during John's drugged out surgery. Now the pseudo-surgeon's gotta cut these bombs out of his arms in three minutes, and those wires are tough. Good thing forearm meat is tender. Live or die. The choice is yours. After a short delay, Diego goes to absolute town on himself. God damn, it's so gushy! This is a nice, disgusting return to well-done torture porn. It's so sick, even Jigsaw has to avert his eyes. The prosthetics for this one are impressive and gross. I mean, I've probably gotta blur this even as I explain and show how fake it is. Don't blame me, blame YouTube. I'm telling you, I love this shit! Diego rips out the second bomb with his teeth, giving him a rare fate for a Saw victim. Success. Father Jigsaw approves. You shall live happily. Henceforth, as Eduardo Manos de Tierra. With intel from Diego, John starts collecting Los Complices. First is Valentina, the faux nurse, who's apparently given up blood work for sex work. She's getting assaulted by a John when someone comes to the rescue. <laughs> Whew, good thing someone's looking out for. Oh, wait, shit, yeah, never mind, okay. Pseudo-surgeon Mateo is a veterinary assistant who also deals drugs to Gabriella, the fake housekeeper. <laughs> Fuck, I love this set. It's classic Saw. Look at those cheap doors opening to cheap plants out there with colored lights washing over everything. It's a great way for the style to match the soap opera elements, and it feels right at home with the rest of the series. Cinematographer Nick Matthews, who shot the trippy spoonful of sugar for Shudder, was committed to making Saw X match the look of the original run. We wanted to bring the giallo color palettes into this movie. Gabriella leaves with her drugs and Mateo gets all peered with a cattle prod, pickle prod. <laughs> Gabriella takes her ketamine or whatever to the nearest public bathroom where she's blocked in by a big pair of botas. She takes out her mace, but that robot pig head hits her with a door and is all like, stop macing yourself, stop macing yourself. With the cronies captured, that just leaves Dr. Peterson, who's already selling more false hope to desperate people. I'm not an angel. Angel wasn't the word I was thinking, lady. Oh, damn, that's a big house. Oh, shit, I said goddamn, that's a big house. Wow. She starts playing Cinco Noches and Cecilia's, where we get a very well-constructed scare. The audience notices before her that there's someone on her roof, and it ain't no Santa Claus. <laughs> 
damn, people in glass houses shouldn't fuck with John Kramer. By the time she gets to her garage, Pighead is already waiting in front of the car. And in the back seat, there'd be two robot Pigheads in these parts. Which, I mean, is pretty obvious. Not like John Kramer was charging people with a pickle prob like that. Nope, he had a helper. This is my associate, Amanda. Amanda Young is back, baby! She's such a great character, and was a damn good contender in the first ever Horror Royal Rumble. Make sure you tune in for the second one on January 20th. I've just gotta wonder why they've got her in that little boy wig. Her hair has literally never looked like that at any other point in the series. Why not give her a dignified de-aging with a backwards cap, like a decent human being? Timeline-wise, this would be after Amanda escaped her bear trap test, but before she took the plunge, <laughs> literally, in Saw 2's trap house, where she worked for John undercover. So, still early in her apprenticeship. Since Peterson's abandoned chemical plant is exactly John's whole vibe, he uses it to stage the group trap portion of the film, which was always a highlight throughout the series. Remember the collar one from Saw 5? Good times. The latest players wake up with a whole lot of questions. Why? Well, actually, it's mostly that one. Instead of hiding behind cassette tapes and creepy dolls, John shames these people face to face. I mean, everyone already knows him anyway. Some react with hysterics, others with panic dread, while Cecilia stays a carny until John shuts that shit down. We're only trying to help you. That game is over. And the new game's about to begin. Valentina is the first one to be challenged in a trap using a Geely saw. John says it's a bone saw named after its inventors, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez. In classic Kramer fashion, he claims he won't be responsible if Valentina dies, and that it'll be a good lesson, blah, 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 blah. This is not retribution. It's a reawakening. So, yeah, he's still the same old self-righteous asshole, but it's easier to sympathize with him against charlatans who steal the last thing terminal people have. Oh. And Cecilia's been doing it a while. Eight years, with 34 prior patients, all of whom died. For her part in the scam, Valentina must cut off her leg and suck out three ounces of marrow in just three minutes. If she doesn't, she'll fall victim to the Beheader 5000. You'll make it. So long as you keep your head. Amanda, get, get out of there. She and John take their box seats to enjoy the show. Bell's performance here is the most convincing he's ever been as actually wanting these people to succeed and change their lives. The timer starts and Valentina's off to a bad start, but eventually Turner kits her leg and Turner gets to sawing the dang thing off. Back and forth now, Valentina. Keep a rhythm. Think Gili, Gili, Gili. Yeah, sure. Just imagine that you're sensually milking a cow. Yeah, act like you're puppeteering a John Wick puppet show. Eventually, she fully severs her leg and is able to stick this dental looking hose into her stump. It sucks out the marrow, which begins to tip the scale since it's the cream of the blood. Ugh. Despite her valiant effort, she doesn't deposit enough bone jelly. The razor moves forward and cuts her head off in a decapitation that feels extra deliberate and ghastly. Man, she was so close too. Not a snooze button man, are you John? I guess that's lights out for Valentina. This death was probably the most complex kill in the movie. Even in my 20 plus year career, that's one of the hardest gags that I've personally done. It took three whole days to shoot, starting with actress Paulette Hernandez using a real saw on her real leg with a protective pad underneath. After plenty of footage of that, and I mean a lot of it, she hid her real leg in a hidey hole and flossed away at a fake leg, which was filled with blood pumps and a prosthetic femur made by Fractured FX. The effect is so seamless, even director Groydard can't tell where the makeup ends and the prosthetics begin. So that leg... It's fake. To top it off, or to off her top, I guess, a full body and head prosthetics were rigged with monofilament to fall apart on cue and go where they needed to for the shot and the story. Tied together with Hernandez's great performance, her first ever in English, the complete effect is nothing short of a magic trick. Almost impressive as the fact that Groydert used everything they shot in the final cut. I don't know what the MPA was thinking, but I'll take it. The decapitation really kills the mood. Gabriella blames Cecilia, while Cecilia blames the young girl's oxy habit. That rubs recovering addict Amanda the wrong way. Sometimes we get sucked into things that are against our nature. This is a more vulnerable scene than John and Amanda ever shared in the other Saw films. Amanda's still damaged and scared, like she was in the first movie. Listen, I'm not ready to do this without you. But disagreements over victim qualification will lead to her rebellious sarcasm we saw in Saw 3. We get to see this evolution since this is the first Saw that stars John and Amanda as the two biggest characters. Every other Saw splits its story between a trap plot and a cop plot, each of which have their own non-John and Amanda main characters who take up most of the 
the time, especially when they're motherfucking slow. In Saw X, it's just these two and their victims, which I love. Groydert was happy they narrowed the focus too. The cops were starting to really bog us down. As for their victims, Cecilia's phone starts ringing in the middle of the room. It's out of reach, but she figures out a way to solve that little problem. You wanted a surgery, John? Here's a surgery for you. A full-on intestinal extraction. We have a rope. Damn, she cut up Valentina like it were arts and crafts time on February 14th. She evil evil. Valentina's tract may look like a dirty, disgusting nerd's rope, but it gets the job done. I love how Cecilia finishes pulling it towards her with a little ta-da. She calls someone and says a few Norwegian words before getting bad dog by Amanda. Look at this mess you made, bad dog. I'm surprised Amanda doesn't shove her face in it. All of a sudden, they hear someone yelling outside the factory. It's Parker Sears. Open this fucking door. John's former fellow patient from the UQ Medical Center is here and says he's also mad about being scammed, so mad he could shoot a pig, which he does. Before he can run away from Valentina's severed head, Amanda knocks him out. He comes to a little later, tied to a chair. Hey, hey little boy, let me go and I'll help you with your homework there. John expresses sympathy towards Parker as a fellow sucker. Still, he says Parker's gotta play a game too. His only rule right now is no guns. Parker agrees, but says he doesn't condone what's going on here. We don't kill. You chopped a fucking head off! See, I always got YouTube comments saying that I talked too much about John being a murderer, but I... The movies won't shut up about it either. I mean, everyone involved, from Bell to the filmmakers, understand that the character is a hypocrite. You can hide behind this moral code that you seem to have or you think you have, but you are the one that's designing these traps. You're the one that's pushing the buttons. Amanda thinks Parker is a risk, but John reminds her that everything he's ever done has always gone perfectly according to plan, which, you know what, is true. Because of her sympathy for Gabriella, Amanda moves Mateo up to the head of the lesson line. Lucky for him, he's got his substitute teacher in the form of Billy the Puppet! Yeah! Oh shit, he riding! I mean, it's taking the little guy a minute, but he'll squeak there eventually. There we go. And he's got a little cassette tape too! Who guard me, Mateo? Okay or don't, and get shocked. Totally up to you, dude. Hello, Mateo. Yeah, I thought so. Mateo's game requires him to use a camera pointed at his scalp to cut out gray matter from his brain and deposit it into a jar? Are you kidding me? John, you're gonna tell a guy to carve his own brain like a Thanksgiving turkey? That is insane, man. Insane in the membrane. Just like Valentina did, Mateo wastes the first good like minute of his time on the clock. After that, he puts Drill the Skull and cracks his little leg open live on camera. Oh, this is must-see TV. Don't close your eyes so much, man. You're missing all the yolk. After exposing his brain, he's starts, oh god, fishing out folds like he was trying to grab the last udon noodle with some chopsticks. He successfully grabs a big worm looking piece of brain meats, but unfortunately the trap doesn't end there. It's gotta dissolve enough so its enzymes can uh, reveal a, a key or yeah, no way is he making it out of this alive. Sure enough, the timer ends and the shawarma mask slams shut. It's not that graphic of a kill by Saw standards, but still plenty disturbing, and uses Telelock for the mask and a callback to Diego's tour. And the kill is still plenty disgusting for Parker. You guys are fucking sick. Yes, sick with cancer and moral righteousness. For Mateo's brain teaser, a fully practical dummy head was made of actor Octavio Hinojosa. He stood right beside it as he fished for lobes like a championship round of gooey Louie. The traps in Saw X were built through collaboration. Most were designed by the writer, storyboarded by Kevin Groydert, and brought to life by production designer Anthony Stabley and a team of Mexican crew workers. And all that's just to get a made. Then you've still got to film a movie with them. Once you get into a trap, you're dealing with special effects prosthetics, VFX, production design, lighting ultimately, and cinematography, and all of those elements have to you know, come together. For his part, DP Nick Matthews highlighted each trap with distinct colors and lighting, and used awesome camera moves like spinning it around on a lambda head. Billy wants to play with Gabriella now. <laughs> No. Aw, she doesn't want to. Still gotta do it, though. She starts floating into the sky like a magical fairy princess. Well, like a fairy princess stuck in shackles. Her task is to use a hammer to break her wrist and ankle free from the shackles. If she doesn't, she risks spending too much time exposed to this giant fan? Radiation machines are not to be trifled with. What, really? A super cancer gun? <laughs> what the fuck, John? Gabriella starts working on her ankles so she can hopefully just swing out of the way. Unfortunately, her Tarzan plan doesn't work, since John programmed the radiation machine with perfect comedic timing. She keeps at it while she's getting fried, with each strike accompanied by what sounds like video game hit indicators. <laughs> 
feel like I just sank five cannonballs into the enemy ship. Gabriello's was the most physically complicated rig for a trap and required constant testing all the way up until the shoot day. Under the supervision of stunt coordinator Daniel Salazar, actress Renata Vaca shared this harness stunt with a double. She would do the forward facing shots, then come down to get progressively crispier layers of burn makeup applied while a stunt performer was taken up and filmed from behind. Most of the movie's effects are practical, with VFX being used to do things like paint out the rig's support cables. As her skin really starts to sizzle, Gabriella breaks her wrist and wins the game. True to John's word, the machine turns off, and he tells Amanda to get Gabriella to a hospital. But this is when Parker breaks his rule and grabs his gun. Turns out he's with Cecilia, and that snake rewards him with some slippery tongue action. <laughs> he unlocks Cecilia, who's eager to get revenge on Amanda and John. They direct John to put himself into his own trap and lose this dog collar match. New game. It's called We Live, You Die. Fuck you. Oh, come on. A game like that'll never carry a franchise for 19 years. John still wants to get Gabriella some help, but Cecilia says it's already game over for the girl and snaps her neck. With all her accomplices dead, she and Parker will get a bigger cut of the cash. Amanda doesn't approve of Gabriella's murder. You suck, bitch! We only microwaved her insides. What you did crosses a line. <laughs> I love Sinov Makoti Lund's performance here as Cecilia celebrates bringing down Jigsaw. She's awesome throughout the whole movie and makes for a great villainess with a sick glee she takes dressing down John. Lund was cast after Groydert saw her on the Norwegian show Ragnarok and she was thrilled to work alongside Tobin Bell. Tobin Bell is a legend. You get a bit starstruck actually, when you meet him the first time. Cecilia sees that this trap was built for two, but has an eviler idea than strapping Amanda in. Bring me the child! Since the audience would know John and Amanda can't die, Carlos was created specifically to raise the stakes. And even Jigsaw thinks that's messed up. A terrible, unforeseen. consequence. Cecilia continues to tear into John as she uses his own logic against him. If you let him die, it's all on you. I mean, if you're being consistent, dude, she's kinda got a point. She's not wrong just because she's evil. Oh, come on, John. You're the scary voice. I'd like to play a game. Evil and mean. Wow, she's so mean. John uses his limited Spanish to tell Carlos not to pull the lever. No harder. Parker starts the trap, which sees the victims pulled flat by chains on a table attached to the Lionsgate logo. It lifts them up to a pair of giant nozzles that will make them pioneers in a new extreme sport. Bloodboarding. John pulls his lever, tipping his end back and slowly drowning himself in Dracula juice. But Carlos takes the heat off him at the last second. Kid must have really loved that bike. Soon as John catches his breath, he taps back in for a fresh coat. Yo, where'd he even get this much blood on such short notice? Like all traps, the bloodboarding was practical and worked as advertised, and was designed to look like it'd be at home in the earlier films. So you see a lot of oxidized metal, you see components that you believe John Kramer's going to be able to actually construct. That's a welcome change from Jigsaw, which supposedly takes place before the other movies, but uses technology that seems newer, kind of a Star Wars prequel effect. It was easy to avoid that here since they shot in an old glass factory. It didn't have plumbing or electricity, but it did come with some pre-existing production design. We had a lot of really strong, uh, sort of hardcore machinery that was here already. They let us oxidize that and make it look as if it was all rusted. Cecilia and Parker have seen enough, but as they collect their loot in the control room, Parker points out a potential plot hole with John's latest trap. But if you were the last player, who was supposed to be on the other side of that plank with you? Oh shit, I think I feel a Hello Zep coming on the soundtrack. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. You know shit's getting serious when we hear that track. Flashback show Diego had already told John that Parker was an accomplice. Amanda intentionally left Cecilia's phone within reach, kind of, so Cecilia would use it to call Parker there for help. After he arrived and was knocked out, John took the powder out of his bullets, replaced the bag of cash with scathing Excel spreadsheets, and rigged the room to fill with poisonous gas. These jackholes have been acting like they beat Jigsaw. Never realizing that you have been the marks all night long. While they deal with that twist, Amanda lets John and Carlos out of their trap. The grifters predictably turn on each other and have a jagged metal fight for the only fresh air socket. Cecilia comes out on top when she stabs Parker in the gut and lets the poison gas boil him like a stovetop hot dog. John and Amanda give Carlos all of Cecilia's ill-gotten gains. You are a warrior, my boy. 
Hope that's enough to cover a lifetime of therapy. The survivors walk into the sunrise, leaving Cecilia Peterson alive? Wait, what the fuck? That's how it ends? I get that there are rules, John, but she's the evil mastermind. Should have torn her ass up like a piranha. We do get one last round of justice in the mid-credits scene, with a faker who started it all, Henry Kessler. He finds himself in his scarless tum-tum strung up in horror's most famous bathroom. He's here thanks to Detective Mark Hoffman, one of Jigsaw's apprentices and main killer of Saw's, uh, uh, what were they, four through seven? Damn, he had to run. Earlier in Saw X, we saw John call him for help. Detective, I could use your assistance in locating some people that are in need of our services. Hoffman tracked down Henry Kessler, brought him here, and ends the movie using 2000 slang. I call that <laughs> epic bad luck. How many pre-kills did John Kramer rack up in this prequel? Let's find out and get to the num- What the- Hey, who are you? Why are you trying to get to the numbers? Look, I, I, I'm James A. Janice, and it's my job! Uh-uh, lie to me again and I'll empty this chamber into your eye! No, I'm not- I'm not lying! I'm, my name is James A. Janice! I've been crappy jokes about horror movies since I title guard a lot! Alright, it's fine. Well, You're safe. Come with us to the numbers. What? That, that seems entirely unnecessary. Yes. Yes, it was. Only four people died in Saw X, consisting of two men and two women, giving us this even Esteban pie chart. If you compare it to the rest of the series, it's a new low, with two fewer kills than Saw's 1 and 5. Saw X had a franchise high when it came to its runtime of 118 minutes, which worked out to a kill on average every 29.5 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Valentina, because of all the moving, bleeding parts. The trap is great, the performance is great, the gore is great, everything's great! The almost shutting for lamest kill goes to Parker Sears, because suffocation and a little acne isn't all that bad compared to losing limbs and or brain matter. As is tradition for Saws, I'll also be awarding the traps. Platinum Punji Sticks for coolest trap goes to the hospital custodian's magic eye puzzle. Now you see them, now you don't see much of anything. There's a reason they use this thing in all the advertising. Rusty Mouse Trap for lamest trap goes to Gabriella's weaponized chemotherapy. Even if you win, best case scenario, you're disfigured. Worst case, you also have cancer. That's fucked up, John. And also, as is tradition, I need to give the sequel a subtitle to help it stand out. You can't just have a Roman numeral, you know? So let's call it Saw X. Los Juegos de Higsaw. And that's it. Saw X came out to the best reviews of the franchise and grossed over a hundred million dollars on a budget of just 13 million. Franchise producers Mark Berg and Oren Coles already have ideas in mind for Saw 11, which will hopefully follow this film's direction. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey everybody, thanks a lot for watching the Saw X Kill Count. Yeah! yeah. This is our friend Carswell, who's here uh, with Make-A-Wish, who came to visit the set and meet uh, me, Zorn, and Chelsea. No, it's been amazing. I'm really happy to meet you guys. It's been so awesome seeing everything and the behind the scenes. Yeah, it's been awesome having you here and you're, you're so lovely to talk to and you're also an actor. Yes, I am. And a, a, a filmmaker. Yeah, I'm trying to get into film as a writer, director, actor, pretty much any uh, department that'll take me, so. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just panhandle, like. Exactly. Yeah, actor for hire. I mean, that's what acting is. That's what it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm getting used to it now, it's okay. <laughs> well, you already landed your first role in a kill count. Do you have a favorite Saw film? Probably four and five. I'm a big fan of the uh, Peter Strom uh, timelines. So. Nice, okay. Well, if you're out there, hire cars well for acting or any other film thing. Pretty please. <laughs> Do it. I'm just, I can't be on this set of hitting everything. I'll go, I'll go. You and Cars will finish it. Okay, I kicked Zorn off the set because he keeps fucking breaking it, so. Be good people.